it, it sort of redeemed CBT for me because I was at a point where I was becoming a bit disillusioned with it because it felt incomplete to me, at least the way I was mm. practicing it. It felt like it wasn't quite fully human. Mm. But realizing that I could incorporate this part of this mindful part, which to me felt like bringing the heart you know, to the head and body of CBT. Welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today we welcome Seth Gillahan to the show. Seth is a licensed psychologist who specializes in Mindful Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT for short. He received his doctorate in psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. Seth is also a therapy advisor with the self-therapy app Bloom, a medical reviewer for everyday health and host of the Think Act B podcast. Over the years, he's authored multiple books on mindfulness and CBT. His latest book is called Mindful Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, A Simple Path to Healing, Hope, and Peace. In this episode, I talked to Seth Gilhan about mindful CBT. Cognitive behavioral therapy is often used to address mental health issues. Although proven to be helpful, Seth believes that adding the component of mindfulness will not only improve our well-being, but can also help us find meaning, purpose, and peace. He shares with us the Think Act B paradigm and ways we can be more in tune with ourselves. We also touch on the topics of alignment, spirituality, suffering, and openness to experience. This was a really, really meaningful, special chat for me, and I know it will be for you too. Seth is a deeply sensitive, deeply thoughtful human being. It's been a pleasure to call him my friend for a couple years now, and I just find his writings really nuanced, but also they combine typical CBT approaches with a whole other level of spirituality that you often won't find in CBT approaches. So I really think you'll find this episode really unique, as I did. So without further ado, I bring you Seth Gillahan. Good to see you after having seen you in person. Yeah, it was nice to finally meet you in person. (laughs) I know. I know. I feel like I know you better now. Probably because I know you better now. Yeah, you're even better in three dimensions. (laughs) (laughs) I've been told it's my best dimension. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, if if one of them has to be your best dimensions, I think that's the best one. (laughs) It's that third one. Mm, For sure. For sure. Look, you know, you have this really revolutionary approach to inner peace, to calm, to reducing anxiety. And we won't, we won't talk about that today. Do you, and do you, do you apply it to your own life? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, a lot of it, I think really originated with, you know, kind of out of necessity, kind of discovering like, wow, I, I need something here. I need something more than, more than what I had. And that's where a lot of it kind of was, was tested and, and grew out of in these past few years, you know, I, I, I know I couldn't have written this book, you know, five or six or I don't know, three years ago, because uh, I just, I hadn't had the experiences that had sort of forced me to the point of pushing some of these ideas. And also, I think I was just too protective of myself, you know, too guarded. I wouldn't have been willing to admit that I was just, you know, like felt like killing myself at times or, or just felt you know, completely done, uh, or I was, you know, pissy with my family or that kind of thing. Like I felt like I needed to present a certain image of myself, but it's, you know, it's BS and it's, I think people know that. You really go all in on your, 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 your personal life. You, you let it all hang out in that, in your new book, which is called Mindful <laughs> Which I realized. <laughs> <laughs> Mindful a Cognitive weeks Behavioral before... Therapy. I just want to say that's the name of the book. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, a couple of weeks before publication, I was like, oh, I kind of reveal a lot of myself in this book, huh? All right. Well, I'm not going to stop that train at this point, but sort of, you know, when you're writing, it's just, it's just you and the page and then, you know, maybe you and your editor, but then you realize like, they're going to, I mean, hopefully be a lot of people who see this. Oh, yeah. It doesn't resonate. I feel like one out of every two people will deeply resonate with your story like that high Mm. of a percentage. So talk a little bit about um, how you got into studying mindful cognitive behavioral therapy. That's the title of your new book. Uh, How did you get into studying it? Um, And, uh, and what is, what makes it different from regular cognitive behavioral therapy? Yeah. It's a great question. Thank you. 
I mean, when I was when I was first doing therapy, I was doing cognitive therapy, just pretty much straight cognitive therapy. So trying to help people change their thought patterns to mostly to lift depression. That was mostly the group of people I was working with, was people who were severely depressed. And then in kind of the next round of my training, I learned a lot about a behavioral approach. So, you know, practicing ways of like facing fears um, and uh, doing things that are rewarding and, and energizing to you know, treat depression and anxiety. And those worked pretty well. I mean, really well in a lot of cases. But then a lot of times there were things that weren't really, didn't really seem to be affected or sometimes even really touched by those, those techniques. So, for example, if someone came in with a ton of worry, there's worrying, worrying, worrying all the time and worrying that this bad thing's going to happen and this bad thing's going to happen. I could try a cognitive technique with them where you say like, all right, well, let's write down, you know, what's your worry? What's the likelihood it's going to happen? What's the evidence from the past? Uh, what's more realistic prediction? And maybe they could see through that worry like, okay, it's not that realistic. But then because of the, the way this goes in a condition like generalized anxiety, it just switches to the next thing. Mm. So, it's not so much about the content of the worries as it is the, the process. It's kind of like just this, this beacon of worry and it just finds, it finds things to attach to. And as soon as one thing passes, then it mm. disconnects and then reconnects to that next thing. So, for that, my supervisor at the time, Dr. Alyssa Kushner, introduced me to a mindful approach where instead of trying to combat the thoughts directly, you shift your relationship with them by noticing them, being aware of when you're worrying. And then instead of really kind of engaging with that worry and getting wrapped up in it, you just allow those thoughts to pass like we would any kind of experience of you know, conscious awareness when we're doing meditation. This isn't necessarily happening in meditation, but it's that type of meditative, you know, mindful response to things. And then another part of the mindfulness approach was just living your life, even with these worries and fears, so not waiting for the worries to go away before doing things that were important to you. So that was really how I came to it. But it took me, that was probably 2010 or so. It took me close to another 10 years to realize that mindfulness wasn't just kind of another, like another silo within CBT, cognitive approaches, behavioral approaches, mindful approaches, you can add them kind of as needed. But to really see that, that these three ingredients are completely commingled, that within a cognitive technique, we can do it in a more or less mindful way, that in a behavioral approach, you know, I can do an activity with more or less awareness, more or less focus or, or attention in the present, more or less acceptance. So, you know, with that CBT triangle, think about the you know, thoughts, feelings, and actions in those, you know, those, those three vertices. And so, with mindfulness, what it seemed like it did for me is, is it introduced a dimension of depth. You, you and I may have spoken about this, but instead of a triangle, it's more like a wedge of cheese. So, we can locate ourselves not just in terms of what we're thinking, feeling, and doing, but, but what's our relationship to those experiences? How present and aware are we? And how, how open are we to receiving those experiences instead of resisting or rejecting them? Wow. Are you, are you the founder? Huh? Wow. No, no, it's revolutionary. Are you the founder of Mindful CBT? You know, I don't think anyone else has called it Mindful CBT, but I'm definitely not the first one to combine ideas from mindfulness and from CBT. So, that, you know, ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy is an obvious example of this. You know, I've, I've spoken with Steve Hayes on my podcast and you know, we find huge areas of overlap. I think some of the differences I tend to keep more the elements of traditional CBT, at least in my, my reading of it. Um, so, you may be directing more more explicit attention to dealing with thoughts rather than focusing, kind of weighting the, the, the mindfulness and acceptance um, part of things more strongly. There's also, you know, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, so MBCT, similar to mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's based really closely on mindfulness-based stress reduction, tends to be an eight-week program, group format, and 
Uh, and that really emphasizes more the cognitive side of things along with uh, this mindfulness approach. So I think there are different flavors of this. I mean, then there are other ones too. Liz Romer and, and Susan Orsillo have their approach, uh, which is what I learned from, from Dr. Kushner as, a, as an early, uh, as a new psychologist. Um, but, but I think, I mean, the, the approach that, I, that I've developed myself, I feel like has its own kind of flavor like mm -hmm. each of these does. Um, and and uh, yeah, so it's interesting. It's like, I, I, like everything else, I guess, to some extent, it's a, it's like, if something's a good idea, it's probably a recombination or a reformulation of someone else's idea. Yeah. And it includes our own stamp, you know, our own voice. I think that's a lot of what makes things unique is just the, the voice we lend them. Oh, yeah. There's a very clear voice in your uh, book. I mean, it's just... It's it's very 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 clearly yours. There is something. There is a, a very calm, uh, loving voice of of Seth that that uh, is the front the front man behind mindful cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I, but the thing is about that's interesting about cog, about mindful cognitive behavioral therapy is that it you claim that it can address questions such as meaning, purpose, and even spiritual peace. So it it goes quite deeper than the claims of regular CBT. I don't think uh, I've never heard Aaron Beck, the founder of CBT, say that CBT helps with spiritual peace. Um, maybe has, maybe has said that. But can you talk a bit about what, what, uh, why, how, how, how does this, how is this thing so revolutionary? What are, what are the the best components of it you think that are contributing to such deep inner peace? Mm. Yeah, it's interesting about Aaron Beck. My guess is, I mean, obviously, you knew him much better than I did. I only met him he was my homeboy. in person twice. He was right? my homeboy. <laughs> and once like, I was just getting homeboy. his autograph on his... <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but my guess is he, would, he wouldn't disagree that, that CBT and, and with or without mindfulness, you know, could, could facilitate you know, spiritual, spiritual connection, um, you know, issues of meaning and purpose. My guess is, I mean, it's, these are things that are really difficult to test and CBT is so connected to a real you know, research tradition and also within psychiatry and that, that world of evidence-based research, I can imagine there may be a lot to lose by making these kinds of what could be considered grandiose claims mm -hmm. within a kind of straightforward, maybe dry academic uh, setting. So, so that's, that's my guess. That's pure conjecture. Um, but, but from the little that I, little contact that I had with Dr. Beck, I mean, as you know, he was such a deeply human person yeah. and it seemed like oh, he yeah, really understood the, you know, the, um, that we're not just a collection of thoughts and, and feelings and actions, but there's something now I'm completely projecting this onto him, but, but my sense is he, he, I mean, like, I think like most of us, you know, we, we recognize that there's a part of us that's neither mind nor body, something that feels maybe a little closer to the heart of who we are. So, with all that as, as backdrop, I, I mean, I, I wasn't really looking, I wasn't looking for a spiritual approach, not consciously. I wasn't setting out to, you know, I'm going to develop a spiritual form of, of CBT, but I was... You know, I was in a lot of pain, mm. emo mostly emotional pain uh, and just uh, mental and um, mental confusion and bewilderment and uh, following this, this prolonged physical illness that, that you know about, we've talked about and yeah. I, I wrote yeah. about. Yeah. And after, you know, months, maybe, maybe a couple, probably close to a couple years of that, I just... I'd reached the end of my own, what, what, I, what I knew within myself to do. I mean, I'd seen every doctor that I had been referred to. Nobody could find any, any real answers. All the answers were like, your brain looks fine. Good news. Your, your heart is healthy. You know, oh, you're, you, you don't have sleep apnea. Like, okay, all right. And my wife would say, well, that's good, but why are you having these symptoms still? And I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's still that. 
so it, it kind of culminated in this one this one night when I was I was lying on the couch after dinner. This was kind of typical for me at this time. And I was and I reached this point in the day where I was just like my mind wasn't really functioning that well anymore. I had no energy. My nervous system was was totally raw. I'd been, you know, doing therapy all day. It wasn't like I'd been, you know, doing I mean, it was deeply emotional work, but it wasn't like the work was was leaving me completely raw. Like there's just something going on physiologically that was not that wasn't well. And so I was lying there on the on the couch just, you know, this refrain in my head, like, I've, I've reached the end of myself, I've reached the end of myself. And then this awareness just came to me that, that like, this, this great relief that the end of myself was not the end, that there was a part of me that began where the small me ended. And it was a, it was a larger self, it was a self that wasn't diminished or even really touched by the things I was experiencing, by the struggles I was having. But it was also a witness to all that experience. That it was, it was a part of me. But it was also a witness to my, to everything about me. It's like I knew me, right? Like I met myself in that moment, and that deeper part of myself was connected to the divine. That's how I experienced it. Mm. So, it, I mean, I think in a way it really departed from what we might think of as academic CBT, but in a way that to me felt like. I felt like I could, I could, it, it sort of redeemed CBT for me because I was at a point where I was becoming a bit disillusioned with it because it felt incomplete to me, at least the way I was mm. practicing it. It felt like it wasn't quite fully human. Mm. But realizing that I could incorporate this part of this mindful part, which to me felt like bringing the heart, you know, to the head and body of CBT, felt like it's like I was, I was really excited and energized about CBT again and that's where really kind of developing these ideas began after I had kind of worked them through in my own life. Wow. Wow. So when did you develop the think act B paradigm? You know it's funny that one actually started back in 2015. Uh, I was invited to, to blog on Psychology Today. I think you I have also blogged there. You need a title for your blog and mm. I was tossing things around. And then I was like, oh, what about, you know, I wanted to keep things simple. So, I was like, what about Think, Act, Be as a way to, you know, summarize cognitive, behavioral, and mindfulness. So, that was the original, that, that, was, the, that was the origin of it. But I didn't realize at the time how integrated they could be. I was just thinking of it at that point as these, these three sort of, you know, connected, but, but somewhat separate approaches. You could sort of, you know, choose one or the other or a couple of them. Uh, but, but it was a bit, a bit fortuitous, I guess, because I feel like my thinking around that has evolved. Uh, the, the label still, still works. Can you explain it, uh, what, what it, what it means to our listeners? Explain your approach. Yeah. So, whenever we're having, I, what I like about Think Act B is it's, it's fairly easy to remember, I think, at least once we commit it to memory. It's, I mean, we can remember tab, if that helps, we think act B, although that brings up, for me, images of a pink you know, soft drink, uh, diet soft drink from the 80s. But it's three ways that we can, can remember to, to shift our experience if we're struggling in the moment. So, if I'm, you know, really suffering at some point, I can say like, Wait a second. Okay, are there are there certain thoughts that aren't helping me here? That's the the think part. Or I can think, you know, are there is there something I need to do in this moment that can help me to move through this experience? That's the act part. And the the B is, you know, am I am I closing down to this experience in a way that's not helpful? Like I was having an argument with my wife the other day and I realized that I was, uh, was really like pushing away that experience, feeling like, like you know, this, this should not be an issue. Uh, we, we shouldn't be, you know, having this argument like this. I don't want this to be happening. And then when I was like, oh yeah, I don't have to resist that. It made things so much better because I wasn't fighting two fights. I wasn't 
dealing with the issue itself than also dealing with my issues with the issue. And then it's like, all right, yeah, this is, this is a thing. Probably something that a lot of couples deal with and we can just deal with that instead of, you know, this, this idea I'm sure from Buddhism about uh, the second arrow, you know, the first arrow that hits us is, is like some, some issue, you know, some problem, but then we add that second arrow, that second layer of suffering, which is like, you know, why is this happening or this shouldn't be happening or that, that struggle that just makes the unavoidable difficulty much more difficult. Yes. Yes. Um, is that, did you go through all three thinking, acting and being? Yeah. So being was the last one. That's the, that acceptance like part. You left something out. Yeah. Oh, oh, you did talk about that. Okay. Yeah. But I think, um, the other important part is that they all affect each other. So that if I, let's say I start, I can start with any of them. They don't have to go, you know, from mm. thing to act to being. I can start with being, mm. which is where I usually encourage people to start. Come into the moment. Good place. Connect to yourself. Good place to start. Right. Take a breath. All right. Now I'm back. So I've gathered up all my, all my horcruxes or whatever, parts of myself that I had distributed <laughs> widely. So I'm back together. And then from that place, then I can ask, all right, what's going through my mind? So that that presence then helps us to identify our thoughts, helps us to be aware of, of what we're thinking. And our you know, changes in our thinking and accepting things as they are can help us to shift our actions. Our actions then in turn can affect our thoughts. What we do can affect our mindful awareness. So the whole thing is integrated and is, is self-reinforcing. In a similar way, but an opposite way as our you know, unhelpful thoughts, unhelpful actions, our lack of presence also tend to be reinforcing kind of a negative spiral. We can, can enact a, a positive spiral to move things in the other direction. Let's talk about one of your chapters called Connect With Yourself. Your own personal story, it seems like you go in, in and out of that feeling a connection with yourself. What, how could people apply mindful CBT practices to connect with yourself? Let's be super practical here. Well, I think it starts first thing in the morning. Mm. So, usually we, our tendency I think is to wake up and we've already left ourselves. We've kind of abandoned ourselves from the moment that we start the day. But, you know, we've, our, our minds are somewhere else. We're, um, you know, thinking about problems that are coming. We're not really in our bodies. Mm. So, I found it's really helpful in the morning to wake up and just co like connect with myself first thing, like connect with my body. Notice like, all right, what's, what's going on with my body right now? Like, how does it feel? Uh, are there, you know, what's the sort of quality of energy of my body? Um, are there uh, certain emotions that I'm aware of? And then, we can take that connection with us throughout the day, but coming back to it as often as we need to. I find it's usually easier to, or, or more effective, to set some specific times to check in with ourselves instead of just kind of having this global, I'm just going to connect to myself all the time, because all the time can easily kind of become none of the time. So, like meal times, I think, can be a, a good time to pause and just sort of check in, like, oh yeah, still here. Still got breath in my body. I don't know if other people have this experience, Scott, but but so often I have this realization that like, oh, like I was somewhere else. Like my body is always here, but it's like my mind was in another place. And you know, it's like we're not we're not a, a unit a unitary being in those moments. And I think that that kind of that kind of fracturing, I experience that fracturing as very. Uh, there's a there's a sort of quiet unease about it, like it's not a state of ease to be disconnected from ourselves. And conversely, coming back to ourselves, just even just like taking a breath and being like, "Oh yeah, I'm right here, I'm right here." There can be something so calming about that. Like just today, I was. Moving from, you know, the, doing laundry in the basement to coming back upstairs to move on to the next thing. And I realized that I was ahead of myself. Like, I was already projecting myself, like, to the top of the stairs when I was in the middle of the stairs with this 
this kind of this pervasive sense that I need to be doing the next thing, like that I shouldn't be here right now. I need to be on to the next thing. But that creates a state of like a conflict between who we are and who we think we need to be. Like again, it's subtle, but I, I experience I it in a as a very as a powerful thing that because I'm at odds with my body, like my body here is a problem if I think my body needs to be there. And if I just come back and like, oh, I'm on this step, I'm on the sixth step or whatever of the stairs, that becomes like, it had been a sort of nothing experience that I wasn't even conscious of, but suddenly it becomes like an everything experience. I'm just on this step and that's everything. Hmm. That's really interesting. That's a really mindful, really mindful approach. Does it feel practical? Because I, I hear what you're saying and I agree it's important to make these things kind of easy to take up in our lives in a real way. So you think that exercise that can help you connect with yourself? Well, well okay, well, what does it mean to connect with yourself? What are you saying? Are you saying connect with your body? Body, mind, mind connects with body, body connects with the mind. What, what, what does that even mean? Yeah, I think it does. I think it means, I mean, most simply body connects with mind. Mm. mind connects with body and both love it like i think yeah. my my body loves conscious attention from the mind it's like mm, thanks for that and my mind loves to remember that it's connected to a body it's like oh yeah there's this whole thing it's the rest of me mm. yeah i think it's it's it, <laughs> it's good to ask these questions scott because so much of this is intuitive and I just kind of take it for granted. Yeah. And the same was true with my writing. Like my editor had similar reactions at times. He's like, what are you talking about? Like be true to yourself or the truth of who you are. Like, what the hell does that even mean? <laughs> All right. I'm going to try to, I'm gonna try to break it down and, and make it real. So yeah, I think connection with ourselves is, I think we experience it as awareness of the different parts of ourselves. And a sense of being whole, a sense of being a body and a mind. And then I would also include a spirit. We can call it different things. We can call it, maybe we just call it our consciousness or our, our soul or whatever. We don't, have to, we don't have to make up entities. It's just an experience, I think, that, that we all can have this, again, a relationship with our experience. And so when I'm connected to my body and my mind, and my attention is, is really in, in the present, in that kind of, that thin slice of what's actually happening right now. That tends to be a really, I guess, a strong place to operate from, but also a very peaceful place. Yeah, you know, Carl Rogers talked a lot about the importance of connecting with yourself. A real big idea of his and uh, arguing existential loneliness is when we are disconnected from ourselves. That's what he called existential loneliness. So uh, that's cool. Okay, let's move on to saying yes. That's one of my favorite ones. Um, as you know, I'm a big fan of improv. I'm, I'm a fan of like, yes, and, you know, like, so talk to me a little about that chapter and some of the ideas in there. And it doesn't mean to like say yes to life, uh, which is also, you know, a uh, Victor Frankl uh, book, book title, say yes to life. Well, you know, it's interesting, Scott, you mentioned Carl Rogers and existential uh, approaches and Victor Frankl. Yeah, and it does stuff, seem right? like, I mean, the, it feels like the more, like the broader we make CBT, the more it just sounds like other types of approaches that, that probably have, that actually that I know have, have considered these ideas, you know, in, in, in depth for a long time. Uh, you know, it's not like mindful CBT is the first time we've thought about like, oh, maybe therapy can address issues of meaning and purpose. I mean, that's. A lot of what I've loved about existential approaches. But saying yes is, man, there's a, there was a, there's a, a priest. What is, I forget what is, what order he's with, uh, but Richard Rohr, um, he's written a lot of, I think, great books. He's great. But he, there's an interview where he described what happens for him in meditation. And it, basically, it sounded like it was, for him, it was an experience of getting to yes and getting past that, what, what I often experience as, as just this automatic kind of no resistance to what's happening. 
this, I, you know, I, I don't like this, I don't want that, I reject that. And the only things that are really sort of allowed in are things that, that feel like pleasure or gain or comfort. But it's just not a very lively way to live. I mean, it's, it's probably how I've lived most of my life, you know, kind of rejecting a lot of experience and only wanting to pursue certain types of states. But, but so much more is open to us when, we, when we're willing to say yes to what's happening. So, so I think that's, these ideas, I, I do find they're, they can be abstract and sometimes hard to articulate. I think in the end, you know, somewhat impossible to, to fully describe. And yet I think we, I think most of us have this experience of a, the kind of, uh, there's an energy, uh, an energy of, of no, or an energy of okay, an energy of resistance and an energy of acceptance. So that's, that to me is kind of the basic, the basic premise. And it, I mean, I had to, had to practice a lot of, uh, a lot of saying yes, because I'd been saying no for a long time to the you know, struggles I was having. Mm, that's like, true. no, I don't want this. This doesn't belong to me. This shouldn't be happening to me. Surely this is you know, not mine. This is, you got the wrong address, buddy. <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah. there it was. So working, working with that, what a, what a different starting point that is to work with what is instead of to say no. No, this is, this is wrong. And I'm not going to deal with this until I, you know, sort of a waiter comes and takes back this, you know, wrong order and brings me the right one. Then we can have a conversation. Yeah. That's a big, you know, that, that's one of your, uh, your cognitive distortions that you talk about is outsourcing happiness to things yeah. when, yeah, yeah. You talk about it in your prior book as well. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it hit me harder this time around. Because, because it had to, you know, because, because I realized how I really thought that, that I, that happiness was not an option until these symptoms went away. Mm. And if that were true, I, you know, I'd still be pretty unhappy. But, um, but thankfully, you know, that wasn't the case. There's more freedom um, available, which I think, uh, again, like Viktor Frankl, you know, wrote about these things very, very eloquently about the freedom we can find in our attitude. When we totally you can't change our circumstances um so, and obviously he knew suffering like like few of us have experienced so yeah that's it, it's interesting scott how i feel like so many traditions come to this like sort of the, the deepest expression or one of the one of the most profound expressions of their their philosophy whether it's buddhism or christianity or uh, probably judaism which i don't know as well but but it's the idea that our, our well-being does not have to depend on our circumstances. Right. Which is not to, yeah, I don't think that's to deny that things affect us or to imagine that we should just be completely indifferent to what happens and, you know, completely, you know, quote unquote, zen, regardless of, of what's happening. It seems like a kind of non-human way to live. But I can be, you know, upset and, and overwhelmed and, you know, feel terrible and still have a part of me that, that is not defined by or identified completely with those experiences that can observe them and, and still find some equanimity and offer compassion to myself in that moment. Like you're, having a, you're having a tough time, aren't you? I did that once when I was, I lay down to take a nap, just exhausted and miserable and, and crying. And then I, I had that experience of like, well, you know, there's a, there's a part of me that can, can observe what's happening here and, and offer connection and compassion in this moment. And so I, I sensed or, 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 you know, had that part of myself say like, like you're having a tough time, aren't you? <laughs> yes, I'm having a hard time, but it really felt comforting, which is, I just find amazing, you know, it's cause it's just me and me, but in that moment, it feels like something bigger. You're very good at showing that to others. So mm. maybe you need to show it to yourself more. I appreciate that, Scott. Well, I find that about you, that you have so much, you bring out the best in people. I think that, I mean, that seems to me to be your mission in life. And I think you, 
Thanks, man. You do that very well. I think you do that by living it. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. Um, yeah, I wasn't yeah. fishing for a compliment, though. I, something I'm so interested in is the no, the notion of alignment. Oh, man, I'm so interested in that. So interesting that. I don't feel like I'm like totally aligned. I feel like I'm just hodgepodge of contradictory drives and motivations and impulses, and I just live a creative life. Do you have to have alignment? <laughs> requirement because all these buddhists and all these self-help people and all these like mindful people are like oh let's be in alignment i'm just like is that necessary <laughs> that's the thing scott talk to me talk that's to the me. thing it's such a shame that mindfulness has been stripped of its realness <laughs> of its fun of its rawness of its edge of its personality, and we're left with these anodyne, yeah. sort of stereotypical or cliched images that are not inspiring, that are intimidating and off-putting. <laughs> I think they are inspiring. And it makes you feel like mindfulness. I mean, it's, you know, as if it's this kind of rarefied experience that it's only available to certain people, or you have to be a certain type of person, you have to wear certain clothes and do certain right, practices. Right. But so, <laughs> so I love your question and I, and I love the spirit Thank behind it. Thank you. Yeah. Which, no, we don't have to, we don't have to be perfectly Whew. aligned. Good. We don't have to be per perfectly accepting. We don't have to do any of this stuff. And not like, and I don't mean that like, well, it's up to you. I mean, if you want well-being, it's your choice. Right. Not at all. It's... We can be mindful and open and accepting of everything, including, I think, times when we're not. So right now, I'm having a really hard time accepting reality. That's what's happening. And that's, that can be part of my awareness. All right, that's what's happening right now. I'm pissed off. I'm bitter. I'm, I don't feel grateful. And maybe that can be part of our awareness too. It's all part of our experience. So I think part of part of real openness to our experience isn't cordoning off certain things. It's like, well, this is appropriate and these kinds of things are okay and you need to check these other things at the door or else you're not being mindful. As if I, maybe I'm sensitive to this kind of thing, Scott, but it, because of my religious background, but at times it feels like there's this sort of, this sort of judgment about like, oh, nope, you need to be more mindful. You need to, like, you need to pray, read your it's Bible. It's like a judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Like a judgment. Yeah. Which yeah. is just, you've written about this, I think. Didn't you write about spiritual materialism? Uh, I spoke, uh, no, I wrote about spiritual narcissism. But it has that, it has that feeling of, yeah, of, you know, we, it's, this is how it is. Like I, I, I said something recently, I think I tweeted something about, you know, if you meet mindfulness in the road, kill it. You know, you're kind of joking about this, you know, <laughs> if you meet the Buddha, um, if anyone tells you this is what it is and it's not this, then, then it, that's not mindfulness. I, part of me would just like to get rid of the label because it's, it's so limiting. But you write it, you have a chapter called Work and Alignment. So, I mean, what, what are some of the ideas in that chapter that you can tell our audience? Because you do see alignment as an important thing. Yes. According to yeah. your words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, t why is it well, important? I mean, I think to me, alignment starts with, with that connection we were talking about. So, coming into that connection with our, you know, so our minds are with our bodies and our minds and bodies are in the present. I mean, our body is always in the present, but we're, we have that, that awareness of ourselves mm -hmm. in this moment. And then, I mean, alignment can mean so many things, but, uh, like we can align with our, um, what I think of as our care instructions, like aligning with our needs for, uh, you know, the company of other people, at least in certain doses, with our needs for adequate sleep, aligning with our need for exercise, for good nutrition. And then on a, maybe a broader level, you know, aligning with the types of, of, actions 
that are called for. Like if I'm, let's say I have something I need to do and I'm putting it off, then I'm out of alignment. I think I'm no longer aligned with the needs of the moment or what's being asked of me. Or if someone wants my, you know, they need my, like, a, like my child needs my attention and I'm working on something else, then there's a misalignment between the demands of that moment and where I'm placing my attention. And I'm going to experience that as... Uh, I see. I see. Oh, wow. That makes a lot of sense. So it's an attention issue. I think a lot of it's an attentional issue. Okay. I also think it's a behavioral one. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm doing work, oh man, I've done this a lot. I'm doing work that's not really, it's not right for me. Like it's, mm. I don't enjoy it. It doesn't bring out the best in me. Maybe I hate doing it. That is, that's a, a major type of misalignment. I see. I see. And mindful CBT can help with that? How does mindful CBT help with that? Do you have an exercise? Uh, here, here's a, a quick exercise. So when, um, you know, when, when we're feeling some kind of uncomfortable emotion, start with, start with uh, being. So just a simple breath can do it. Breathe in. Breathe out, just feel that connection with ourselves. Okay. And then we can ask from that place of connection, what do I need right in this moment? What is the need that my body or my mind or, or a deeper part of myself is calling for? Just take a moment and listen for that. And then with that awareness, we can choose to act and bring ourselves more into alignment. I think some of these ideas might sound big, like living in alignment with your true self, but mm -hmm. that can be really simple of just like doing activities that you like doing, like boom, aligned, alignment check. Wait, but uh, I'm confused. So if I like, what if I can't get the thing I want right now or what I need? What, well, how's that, how's that helping anything? Like I say, what do I need? And then I think of something I need, you know, what if I like, you know, something like I want, I need, I want to need like a $300,000, you know, to, you know, like, and that, and that doesn't come, doesn't that make me, so what is, I'm sorry. So how is just thinking about that helpful? Explain that. Mm. Well, part of alignment, I think, is aligning with the reality of our situation. So I found, you know, I was out of alignment when I was insisting that, you know, I shouldn't be sick. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I had, yes, I had a need to to be well but i thought that the only way i could come into alignment was to fix my health that's it and i was holding out and i wasn't going to be okay until that happened mm. but i found this powerful alignment that to me felt like healing scott i i wasn't expecting this but rather than my health kind of coming down or you know improving to match my expectations my demands were were shifted to match the reality of where I was. And in a practical way, you know, I wasn't overextending myself beyond the limits of my, my energy, my concentration, like I had been. And that felt like real alignment. It's like, all right, this is, this is who I am right now. Like if I had a broken leg, I wouldn't expect to play basketball. That would be a huge misalignment. I'd probably literally misalign my bones if I did that. Yeah. Yeah. I see. So it's not like your mind is conjuring up the thing that you want um, what are you doing? You're getting in touch with, what is that meditation practice? It's getting in touch with, what is it doing? It's honoring, it's honoring something within you. Maybe that's the way to phrase it. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a, it's addressing, it's identifying an actual need. So there might be a need for, I see like, like I need, like I have this, this mismatch with my health, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm struggling with this, with this issue. And then by being aware of it, by honoring, okay, I have this need, I have this, this sense of something is not working. Something's not working here. And then from there, I can figure out ways to address it. But it doesn't have to mean, oh, I have to fix this thing, or the first thing that I want, it has to be that way. Maybe I'm lonely, and I want to be with people, but that's just not available to me in that moment. I can find alignment by accepting that that's the way things are, and then also maybe making plans for, you know, when I can to develop more connections. So I experience less, less 
loneliness. Cool. Great. Well, let's 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 move on to this idea of coming home. I mean, I think it, I mean that's a big theme of your whole book. It's, it's just it, it, in a way, it it, it it seems like this reoccurring theme is we we kind of lose touch with ourselves, or we lose touch with our values, we lose touch with our purpose, we're like losing touch with things. And mindful CBT seems to be a constant coming home. A cycle, a cycle of coming home and leaving ourselves, coming home. I don't know, is what I'm saying resonating at all with you? Completely. Completely, yeah. I didn't realize that until I got to the last chapter. That, that was kind of what the book was about. But <laughs> I but love I when like, that happens. Oh, though. wow. Yeah, I, Isn't that funny? Because that could have been the and, title of your book, yeah. Coming Home. It could have been, and, and maybe it would have been more resonant than you know, these four very academic sounding words. <laughs> I love your title. Well, you know, I love your title as it is, but it, you know, easily could have also been coming home. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. We'll talk a little bit about, about that idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's once I started thinking about that theme and those terms, I realized that that theme is everywhere. Mm. I mean, it's, you know, I, I talk about a Disney movie, you know, where that's such a prominent theme, probably a lot of Disney movies. That's true. Because I think we all crave, on a deep level, we crave real connection. That's our, I think that's what we're built, that's what we're built for in, in our, our deepest reality is that we are connected, that the separateness we imagine is not kind of the ultimate truth of, of how things are. Anyway, that's a bit abstract. But I realized that, that we were, that we can come home to ourselves in so many so many different ways, like just coming home to, or, or connecting with ourselves in the moment is a kind of homecoming. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, I'm here. I'm right here. And that, right. again, I mean, I've, I've talked about this already, but, but there's a, uh, there's a sense of peace and calm that comes from that, um, that, that for me, I experience it as addressing this fairly constant drive I have to like, improve things or change things, um, you know, change my experience, look for things that are better. But that's, that tends to disconnect me from what's actually happening mm. in a way that I don't really experience the things as they are and definitely don't appreciate them. So if I'm sitting at my table, you know, at a, at a meal, for example, I might be thinking about, you know, these, you know, these problems I'm dealing with or these things I'd like to change. And I'm not really realizing, you know, I've, I've got this, this table to eat at. I've got food, you know, as much food as I want. I have these people that I can share these meals with. But I'm looking for something better, something different. But when I just come back, I'm like, like, notice things as they are. Like even, you know, the plates that I'm using or the, you know, the, the fork that I'm holding the glass in my hand, the water uh, that I'm drinking, it does, it just, it just feels like a homecoming. And, and it feels like it satisfies that deep craving that we have to, uh, to be at home with ourselves, to feel comfortable. I think of home as a place where we feel comfortable, like we can put up our feet and you know, maybe that's not the home we grew up in. Maybe home is not a place of comfort and ease, but, uh, but we can find a, a true home, that kind of, that kind of mythic home. Uh, that's, that's always right here. I think it's always here when we come back and, cause even for, you know, for, for people who are listening right now, I think even just taking a moment that can be, we can tap into that we can realize like, oh, like I don't have to search everywhere else for that, you know, the peace of mind that I'm looking for. You know, I compare it to, you know, like having your, having your glasses on top of your head and you know, looking around everywhere, like, where are they? Where are my glasses? And you're like, Oh, they're right here. They're right here. Yeah. So that's what I what I come to in the book. Spoiler alert! But the the home we're looking for is always right here. It's always available. It's a really powerful message, like pr like profoundly powerful message. You say we are mind, body, and spirit, and the answers we seek to life's persistent problems will inevitably include tending to our thoughts, acting in alignment with our goals, and being present to our experience. Um, end quote. Seems like those. That's a good summation of uh, of some of the main components of mindful CBT and your Absolutely. approach. 
thanks for the really pioneering work that you're doing in this field, in this, um, in this approach and for all the people you're helping. And, um, I hope whenever you're feeling down, you can reconnect with your own self by remembering and reminding yourself just how many people, life, how many people's lives have changed thanks to your work. Yeah. Uh, wow. so hopefully you can remember that to help you reconnect with yourself and have your own homecoming. So mm. thank you so much, Seth. Thanks for being on my podcast. Oh, thank Again. you, Scott. Thank you for your kind words. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.